Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's been a while since I've done a webinar, actually, so it's really nice to be back doing a few bits. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the Digital Economy Act and just a snapshot of some of the data sets that are available. As part of this, we're going to talk a little bit about the accreditation process, just because I think that's that's something that people may not be so familiar with. And it's, you know, it's really good to, to have an understanding of the process before you look at um, applying for access. So my name is Deb Wiltshire. I'm the Data Access Services Manager at the UK Data Service. My colleague today um, is James Scott, who will give us a little wave. Um, he is one of the senior user support and training officers. I want to just give a shout out as well to um, Simon Whitworth from the UK Statistics Authority. Now, he can't join us today, unfortunately. He's he's at another event, but we'd just like to um, express our thanks for, for his input into the content of today's webinar. I think most of us are probably aware of this, but it's worth just recapping. So we know there are various pieces of legislation that come into play when you're looking to access personal data or personal information. And which legislation applies will depend on where the data is coming from. Now, it's in practical terms, if you're applying for data, you may not need to know a great deal of information about that legislation. One of the main important points is that actually the data protection legislation is actually what supports and allows us to provide responsible access and use of data for research purposes. Today we're going to focus specifically on the Digital Economy Act and we're going to have a look at some of the data that are made available through that gateway. Um, but just to be aware that there are other legis um, pieces of legislation that might be relevant. So the Digital Economy Act or the DEA came into being um, quite recently, so 2017. And this really aims to provide certainty and clarity for public authorities and researchers looking to access data for research. And the idea was to create a gateway for public authorities to access data in the public interest. Now, the term in the public interest is a very important one, and we'll come back to that. Now, the aim of the Digital Economy Act really is to provide a single gateway for secure data access. And it's really looking to replace the need for multiple gateways, which is what we've we've had over many years, because this can be a very complex and lengthy process to navigate for researchers. And it, it can actually be quite confusing. So the aim is to replace this with a single gateway. Now, we're not quite there yet. Um, for example, health data collected by public authorities isn't collected at the moment, um, included rather at the moment. But this is the aim. This is what the, the legislation is trying to achieve. So the, the gateway uses a trusted third party model where an accredited processor will link, de-identify and make securely available. Sorry, this is a typo at the end of that sentence. Um, secure data and then make that available to an accredited researcher for an accredited project. And I'm going to dig into some of these terms a little bit more. But just to give you a little bit of background, so the Digital Economy Act gained royal assent in April 2017, and it made substantial amendments to the St uh, Statistics and Registration Service Act. Now, it has a number of govern, uh, governing principles on disclosure of data, and these are around the principles 
that you can see, so legal, ethical, et cetera, et cetera. The important bit for researchers is to be aware of this accreditation criteria. So these are our processes, projects, and researchers that I mentioned. Now, the UK Statistics Authority, I mentioned them a little bit earlier, they are um, the accreditor, and there are a number of accredited data processes of which the UK Data Service is one of them. And we became an accredited processor back in March 2020, and we're just undergoing our, our first year review of that accreditation. Now, an accredited processor's role really is to carry out data linking, matching preparation, and or provide secure research facilities. The accredited projects and researchers. Now, if you've have if you've already accessed data through the ONS, you, you will be familiar with the approved researcher scheme. And the accredited projects and researchers is broadly consistent with that. One of the main differences is that ethical approval is now sought under accredited researchers. So here's where we get into the, the, um, the practicalities of applying for you as researchers. So the, the application process is a multi-stage process. At the moment, you must be based in the UK to apply. And there are two stages, really. So you need to become an accredited researcher. So that involves meeting the data owner's criteria and also attending a short training course. Then you will need to submit a research proposal. Now, we'll look at these in a little bit more detail, but essentially you've got to show that your, your research is going to have a valid statistical purpose and that it's feasible. So to become an accredited researcher or an AR for short, you will need to submit an application form and you'll have to meet this accreditation criteria. Now, the UK Stats Authority manages the accreditation process. The good news is that AR status, once you've, you've been given it, lasts for five years. So it's not something that you need to be doing for every project or every year. That status will cover you for five years. The other good news is that you can use that status across all accredited DEA processes. So if you go through the process with us at the UKDS, and then later down the line, you decide that there's some data um, at HMRC that you want to go and apply for, you take that AR status with you. You don't have to go through that process afresh for HMRC. And we think that's a real bonus. As part of becoming an AR, you need to agree to your name being added to the UK Stats Authority website. Now, the accredited researcher criteria, I'm just going to include that because I think it's quite important to make sure that you are able to meet the criteria before you apply for secure data. And this is the um, criteria for um, the AR status. So you need to have an undergraduate degree or higher, which includes a significant proportion or of maths or statistics. So there has to be some element of quantitative work. Or you need to be able to demonstrate at least three years quantitative research experience. The next stage is you have to successfully complete a safe researcher training course, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. As I say, you have to agree to um, be included on a list of all accredited researchers. You have to agree to publish the results from all of your research projects completed through the um, 
accredited researcher scheme and you have to sign and adhere to a formal accredited research documentation. So that a declaration. So that's that's the criteria. Now the SOF researcher training is um, it's actually just part day now. We used to do this face to face, obviously, in the days before COVID. Um, but we've now moved the training onto um, Zoom. We deliver all our training through, through Zoom. So it lasts about three hours, three and a half hours, depending on, on the group. The premise of the training really is that using sensitive, controlled, secure data, however you want to, to term it, is largely about common sense. And researchers will have this common sense and we know that however there are some areas where specific knowledge about disclosure risk and how to mitigate it is required and not all researchers will know that if they've not experienced working with secure data before so this really is is the the aim of the training is to make sure all researchers have this specific knowledge so essentially the course will look at the wider context. So we'll talk about how we understand data access. We talk about the five safe framework. We always have to talk about what happens if things go wrong so that people are aware of um, their responsibilities as a researcher accessing secure data. We talk about what we mean by being a safe person and we talk about the research community and how, how that functions in this context. And then we move on to the more technical knowledge. So this is the, the section where we talk to you about statistical disclosure control, what that is and how it's applied. And it really varies with the people that we, we train. Some will come and they will have some knowledge of of this already for others it will be completely new i think most participants that come on the training actually find it quite interesting which is which is good because obviously talking about this some of this stuff can be quite dry um, but people do tend to find it interesting and they go away you know quite happy with with having gone through the training at the end of it all attendees have to take and pass an online test and that's important so it, just turning up at the test isn't enough you have to pass the test in order to get your accreditation so moving on to projects so project applications will require approval by data owners and by the independent research accreditation panel or RAP. So we, we have a lot of acronyms, so we tend to forget and throw those, throw those around a little bit. Now, project applications have to be thoroughly completed. So these aren't things that you can do in a, in a quick five minutes over a cup of tea. They need to be thought about because the, the RAP will pay close attention to what you write. And what they really want to know is, are you meeting the public good? Are you meeting this, this criteria? Can you demonstrate that? They also want good evidence of ethical approval. Now, most academics will be familiar with their, their institutional ethics processes. And most academic projects now have to get ethical approval from their universities or their institutions. The additional requirement here is that project proposals um, will have to complete a UK Statistics Authority self-assessment ethics form as well. Now, some project proposals will require a bit more ethical scrutiny, and those are reviewed by the NSDEC. I'm not going to go over the ethics forms 
in great detail, but it's worth just introducing you to the framework that the UK Statistics Authority use. So they've developed an easy to use framework for researchers to use to assess the ethics of their projects. I actually think this is quite a useful framework. Um, it's a, a good tool, I think, to start to think about assessing your, your own projects, regardless of whether you're applying through, through us for, for data available under the DEA. And the idea of the framework is that it helps you to identify and think about how you would mitigate any ethical issues. I'm not going to go through them all because, you know, we don't really have a lot of time to do that today, but it's worth noting that there are six main principles and each principle is split into a number of items. So there's 22 items in total. And the, the self-assessment form will guide you through each of those 22 items and it will ask you to, to identify any potential issues. Um, there is a lot of guidance on the UK Statistics Authority website, and I can pop the link to that in the chat once I hand over to James. I want to just mention the research accreditation panels because I think they play a really key role. Now, obviously, RAP is the panel that, that assesses the applications for the Digital Economy Act, but if you go through other access pathways for, for data available through other legal gateways, you will meet their own individual research accreditation panels or approvals panels. Whatever panel reviews your application, they have a lot of similarities. So their aim is to review and approve your application. And they're tasked with doing that in a transparent and fair way. They meet periodically. Most of them, certainly all of the ones I know, will meet monthly. And I think that's, that's fairly standard. But just be aware that there might be some differences if you're going through other routes. And essentially, their task is to look at your project, look at the information you've provided in your research proposal and make a decision. Is it legal? Is it ethical? And is it feasible? So when I say about your research proposal needs to be filled in com very comprehensively, this is why there has to be enough information for the panel to make a properly informed decision. Now, again, what materials you have to provide might vary a little bit, but these are the standard things. So your project application will need to be provided to them and your ethics assessments will need to be provided to them. And occasionally there might be some other supporting materials. Now, an outcome for a research approval panel or accreditation panel you have a number of potential outcomes. So the, the, the best outcome for everybody involved is that there is a full approval at first go. So they have a look at your, your application, your research proposal, they're perfectly happy with it and they can approve it straight away. Or it might be that they will approve it, but on condition that a few amendments are made. There is of course, the, the potential that um, a proposal might be rejected. It is actually rare. We don't see that very often. And I think the reason we don't see that is obviously because we do a lot of work with researchers before the uh, panel see the research proposal to make sure that it's a good quality. So if you're applying for the UK data service, our access team will triage all of your applications before they are sent to the wrap. And the outcome really from doing this, this triage, is that we don't get many applications that come back 
with anything other than a full approval. Now, full approval at first go is obviously the, the aim for all of us because if we have to do a lot of to and throw in and it has to go back to the panel for a second time, then obviously that will take a little bit of time. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to James, give you a break from, from me talking. Good. <laughs> uh okay have you stopped sharing your screen Debs? okay so we just want to have a look just for an example really um of some broad areas you know we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the data sets that are available under the dea um and we thought we'd split them up into these five broad areas and give you an example from each just so that you get a reasonable spread I and mean, clearly this is a, a tiny snapshot really an absolutely tiny snapshot but anyway we, we thought this would be a, a reasonable way of doing it so we're going to start with the uk innovation survey uh this in itself contributes to the europe wide community innovation survey um, and it's the main source of information on business innovation uh, in the UK. And what it does really is it looks at general business information, <coughs> excuse me, a good services and process innovation, uh, and the context for that innovation. It's based on firms with more than 10 employees, and there are approximately 16,000 enterprises. Um, and an enterprise uh, is defined as being active in innovation uh, if it introduces a new or significantly improved good service or process. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, um, so it could be engaged in an innovation project or innovation projects that are not yet complete or in longer term innovation activities such as uh, basic research and development and, and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of gives you a little, little flavor of that one. Um, and actually what we're going to do with the next few is also give you a, a few brief examples. Again, it's the tiniest of snapshots, really, about just to show the breadth of some of the publications that have come off the back of using <coughs> these data sets. So you can see here um for this is literally just the, the tiniest of snapshots but you can see here that we've got stuff about uh yeah financial constraints on an innovation um and we've got one on economic change in the labor market um the role of open innovation uh, and companies motivations uh and private and external benefits from investment and intangible assets and you know, there are obviously many, many more than that, but it gives you a sort of broad idea about, you know, what, what you can do with it. OK, the second area that we're going to look at, <coughs> oh, sorry, also, I should say the second data set we're going to look at um, is the is what we call the ASH, really, the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings. And this is a 1% sample of individuals uh, from NI records, about 140,000 to 185,000. Uh, you can construct a panel data set, which obviously is quite useful. Um, the employee completes, so arguably, I mean, some people argue that it's more accurate than some other surveys. Um, and it includes data on wages, paid hours of work, pensions arrangement, age, occupation, industrial classification codes, uh, and more. And actually, the low pay commission use ASH to provide evidence on the impact of the minimum wage, uh, which is obviously sort of, you know, fairly central uh, for evidence-based recommendations. So again, you know, it's, it's a very useful uh, data set to be able to access. <coughs> um, in terms of ash based sort of uh, publications you know there are a few here uh, again you know a tiny snapshot so one on public sector resource allocation since the financial crisis that's a fairly recent one uh, another reasonably recent one rising pay for performance among higher managerial and professional occupations in britain is eroding or enhancing the service relationship and then there are other ones on living standards poverty and equality um and productivity investment and profits you know going back a little way little way so you can see again you know quite a broad range even just within that that tiny snapshot of four there um in terms of what people are, have been doing with it um <coughs> oh god <coughs> do it excuse me sorry so uh thirdly third one we're going to look at out of the five is what we call the words 
the Workplace and Employment Relations Survey. Uh, so this is a cross, it's three cross sections, basically. So it's a cross section survey of managers. Um, and that looks at things like recruitment and training, consultation and communication, employee representation, uh, pay determination and payment systems, grievance and discipline, equal opportunities, work life balance, health and safety, all these kinds of things. Secondly, it includes a cross-section survey <coughs> of employee representatives, um, and that uh, includes information on the structure of representation at the workplace, time spent on representative duties, means of communication with employees, um, incident of negotiation and consultation over pay and other kinds of uh, things. Um, and their involvement in things like redundancies, discipline and grievance matters, that kind of stuff. OK, so so that's the one for employee representatives. And the third one is a cross section survey of employees. OK, and that third one is you know very much around sort of things like working hours, you know, the amount of influence you have in your job and your job satisfaction, your working arrangements training and skills, uh, information and consultation, pay, that kind of stuff. OK, so it's, it's coming at it from several different angles. And oh, God, excuse me. Uh, um, so, yeah, again, you know, really useful, really useful data set. And in terms of some of the research that's come out of it, you know, we can see here that there's different perspectives on multi-skilling and product market vol volatility disability and earnings um you know does it make a difference around you know the employee character employee characteristics uh workplace performance um and worker commitment and loyalty gender pay gap and even just within that four you can see that there's there's, there's a fair breadth involved with uh you know with, with what's being done with it and i'm sure you it's far broader than that that's that's really just tip of the iceberg stuff really <coughs> Um, the fourth one is a crime survey for, <coughs> excuse me, crime survey for England and Wales. Started in 1981, and it's a victim survey, so it really asks whether the respondent has been a victim of crime in the previous 12 months. Um, children aged 10 to 15 have started to be included from 2009, um, and the first set of that data is, is, just, is held separately. And it's under its own uh, catalogue record. Um, but after that, children's data included in the main data set. Um, there is some good stuff on the ONS web page about the crime survey for England and Wales, if that sounds like something that, uh, that you would be interested in. Um, so, you know, it's adult self-completion. Uh, you know, there are mod modules on drinking behaviour, drug use, stolen goods. <coughs> um, the geography is, is low level as well you get hate crime variables interpersonal violence uh, you know this can be domestic violence sexual victimization and anyone that's done the SRT course to another we include an example around this um, so yeah that's that's kind of gives you gives you a sort of overview of the main main aspects of that um, and finally Oh God! Excuse me. There's um, well, we all know what this is because we probably all did it in the last few days. Um, we all know uh, pretty much what the census is, really. I think. Uh, so um, you know, we know it happens every ten years. You know, it goes to all the households in Wales and England, and it yeah, helps organisations to make decisions on planning and funding public services. Um, I imagine that, uh, as with, with most of them, people have been putting various sort of protest kind of answers in. I, I think it was the previous one that I, I heard a lot of people put their religion, well, not a lot, but a, a significant minority of people put their religion as Jedi, um, which is a bit daft, but they are. And I think a lot of people put in their nationality as European um, at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it includes stuff around transportation, education, health care. You know, obviously, it's a really important thing to do. Uh, in, in for so many reasons, really. <clears throat> uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, we have um, the, the samples of 
I know that way. Deb, do you think you might be able to do the last couple of slides, Deb? <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Let me. Can you just um, move sharing. the slides on for me, though? Shall I? Oh, yeah, I okay, can do it. It's only, only about three left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. doing a COVID update. Okay. Oh, oh, the last oh, slide anyway. Oh, that was the last one. It's just the oh, help. Well, <laughs> Oh, I thought they were. Um, so we had a question about um, if you are in a position such as being a um, data protection officer or something similar, do you still have to undertake the safe researcher training? Now, actually, you could thinking about it, you can read that question a, a couple of different ways. So I'll answer it a couple of different ways. So if you wish to apply for um, data available under the DEA, then yes, you will have to undertake the safe researcher training as part of the accreditation process, regardless of, of any previous training or job role that you would have had. If you if you look at it and think, do you need it to do you need the training to be something like a data protection officer? Officially, no. However, it actually probably would be quite a useful course to do for that. Um, so it might be worth doing a, a safe researcher training course if that's something that you're looking at doing um, so how does one negotiate with a da processor and data provider to enable a um so how does one negotiate with a dea processor and data provider to enable a data provider to make data available for a project uh, it's a good question so in, in terms of the the provider we we would normal in terms of the data owner that was part of the the various feasibility checks that the uh, the processor would do. So, for instance, if uh, for each I think you mentioned earlier, each application that comes in, um, the uh, the processor, so yourselves or ONS would be uh, checking the project in terms of if there's a legal gateway. So, for instance, you know, is the the DEA the, the right gateway? Um, is it feasible to do that research? Is there a, is the data owner uh, approval for that research? So we, we would normally go through the various feasibility checks, make sure that the application has been completed uh, effectively uh, with re uh, prior to doing the, the data owner approval. Um, I suppose it's, a good, it's very much up to the, the, the researcher themselves, which process they, they would wish to uh, select. And sometimes that's dependent on the data set. So for instance, we ONS holds um, certain data like the longitudinal studies, uh, well, it's only available um, in the um, in the SRS, our Secure Research Service. So, uh, whereas there'll be other data sets that the the UK Data Archive hold that uh, the ONS doesn't. So, it often depends on the um, you know say those data sets, and 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 often then it could there could well be a discussion if if people want to link data sets that have multiple data owners, and those data sets aren't already available as a linked data asset, then. Invariably, there may well be discussion between the the processors as to um, where 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 that research perhaps will take place in terms of those data owners. So um, that is sometimes uh, you know a discussion that may well take place, and often those discussions might happen before a uh, applicant submits the uh, their application. Um, so I think it, it's often sometimes done on a case by case, to say depending on where the data set is held and. And likewise, it, you know, it depends sometimes on the type of user. So uh, most government access may well take place in the secure research service because um, that's very much um, sort of where our traditional focus has been. But uh, we do, obviously, we do um, have researchers from across all sectors. Um, but to say it, it can depend on, on a case by case. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Bill, if uh, I think Bill's on the call as well. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, thanks, Bill. Hi. Hi. Um, so after after the big build up, I know I think Nick's covered that one. To be, to, to be honest, I have I've probably not got much more to, to say on that one. Thank you. Sorry, Bill. I didn't um, announce you at the end. I hadn't realised you'd joined us. So, so no, it's fine. I was late. Don't worry. <laughs> Apologies for for not giving you the grand introduction. Um, there is another one actually, though that that Bill and Nick, you might. Um, be able to answer is to look at the link 
between I'm presuming that's um the ONS and ARD UK and UKDS would you be able to clarify what the link if any is between UKDS ONS and ARD UK the link between ADR UK and ONS I think is 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 very clear they we are part of the partnership um ADR UK is um is a partnership. There's uh, the the trusted research environments and the devolved administrations um, are are all part of that partnership. Um, and ADR UK fund um, significant funding to the SRS, so they've they've helped us to 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 grow the service. Um, I guess the common link there is is um, that the the other parts of that network are all accredited under the DEA. Um, as data processors, and I guess that's then the link into um, the UK Data Service or UK Data, data Archive, to be precise. Nick, am I, it... yeah, and I, and I think just just to add to what Bill said, you, you're right, Bill. Um, so at the at the ADR UK, which uh, fundamentally is managed through ESRC, the Economic Social Research Council, and uh, I know there's obviously a funding connection there for, in terms of also with UK Data Service, um, but um, they also fund, as, as Bill mentioned, to develop and enhance our service. So, for instance, the SRS, we've done additional enhancements in terms of the capacity and the performance of that. Uh, likewise, we've developed a research accreditation service, which some of the people on the call may have used, which is the, our online system for people to submit applications to be an accredited researcher or to submit accredited projects. And then once your project's live, you can manage it through that system. Uh, and we are sort of putting further enhancements in place whereby that system will host any application to be a researcher or uh, for a project under for a DA processor. So we're, we're engaging with the other, pro we will be engaging with other processors to see if they want to uh, use that system. Uh, and also, um, see those enhancements, but particularly around bringing and acquiring and curating new data, linked data sources. So some of you uh, on the call may be aware that um, the Data First program, which is managed with the Ministry of Justice in terms of bringing in linked courts and magistrates data and subsequently prison and education data. So there's a there's a program of work really to bring in a, a, a number of additional linked data sets to, uh, to support further analysis. And I think that's been instrumental in enabling us to bring in about 20 new data sets, both linked and additional COVID data sets over the, uh, the last 12 months. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Nick. Just one other um, comment um, on that is the ADR UK and UKDS are both funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, thank you, Richard, for that one. At what point would the project need to achieve Research Ethics Committee approval? Um, is that after the project has been approved or before? Um, is the REC approval from a uni sufficient here, or is there a specific REC approval from the data owner which will be needed? So you will need to provide your university approval and you will need to complete the UK Statistics Authority self-assessment um, ethics form as well. And these have to be done before the project goes to the wrap for approval. So that needs to be submitted at the same time, ideally, as your research proposal does. So if you're coming through the UKDS, the ideal would be that you send your, your um, research proposal and your ethics forms at the same time. And I would imagine that that would be the preference if you are going through the ONS SRS as well. It makes life a lot easier if we have all the paperwork up front and then we don't have to keep going back and forth to chase various bits up. Somebody's commented that they can see a list of projects on the UK SA site. Is there a list of accredited researchers? Um, and if so, where are they? I can answer that if you want that. Please, Nick. 
Yeah, sure. So all projects that have been accredited under the Digital Economy Act are, are listed on the uh, UK Stats Authority website. I'm happy to send a link to, to Deb um, following this uh, meeting. Um, and, that, and recently on that same landing page further down, uh, you can also find a list of all accredited researchers. So that, that, that's been added quite recently, I think. The, um, there's probably going to be another iteration of that uh, in the next uh, few days because um, we've sent <laughs> we've sent we've just sent the list to the stats authority uh, in terms of the list we maintain um, and the that includes certainly um, everybody I think has been accredited by uh, ourselves ONS or the uh, by UK data service and those applications similarly I think it includes one or two of the other processes where so uh, as Deb said earlier and there's you know the desire is to recognize researchers from different processes, but uh, providing that there's consent from those uh, initial researchers that they um, that we get those lists from the relevant processes. So where we have that, then the, that's uh, that um, sort of transfer, transfer really between the rec recognition, if you're accredited under um, UK Data Archive is set to uh, via this, you apply through them and then that you are accredited, then you'll be recognized for the DEA and you'll be able to use the the other services from across the DEA. So that, that list is maintained on the, the Status Authority website and I can send the link for those to, to Deb after this meeting. Brilliant, thanks Nick. And then I can send them round um, after the event. Um, just a quick question from someone about training. So in the fullness of time, does the UK Data Service intend to offer a series of courses on access which could become a required element of research training. Um, yes, I have to say we have been discussing this and I think it would be really, really useful for, for people, um, especially people that are coming to this process new and, and don't have a lot of experience or, or background with secure data. I think it, it's, um, it's essential that we do that and we, we will be doing that over the coming months. So really, at the moment, we've, we've just started to dip our toe into that with, with this webinar and, and a previous webinar I did last month, where we talked a little bit about the application process. Um, but yes, we certainly do intend to do um, some further training on that. Whether it becomes a required element of research training, that's probably a question that's sort of above my my scope, really. But I, I think it would be an excellent element to all research training, if I'm honest. I think especially as more and more researchers are finding that they want to be accessing these data. I think it's, you know, more training is, is definitely the way to go. Um, so do keep your eye on our website for future events coming up. Um, okay, so I think the last question we've got, um, again, Nick, I'm afraid Bill, Nick and Bill, it might be, might be back to you. Um, is, so a DA processor may provide linkages, et cetera, between data sets data linkage slash entity resolution is a complicated area which has an implication on results. Are there any plans to expand on the documentation of the methods of linkage? Uh, okay, shall I take this one, Nick? You go for it. Um, so, I mean, I think it's uh, one important uh, distinction to make is that when we talk about accreditation um, under the DEA, you can be accredited for essentially hosting the data, um, uh, and then that's what the SRS is accredited for. And then there's a there's a another type of accreditation which is um, the linkage using um, identifiers essentially. So the SRS won't hold identifiers we can't do the kind of linkage that can be done elsewhere within ONS uh, because a separate part of ONS has been accredited for that purpose. I just mentioned that. Um, in terms of guidance, um, I, I don't know. What I do know is that um, internally in, in ONS we've recently set up a sort of 
uh, I can't remember its name, but it, it's, it's like a centre for, for, for linkage. Um, and, uh, you know, I think and this is really in recognition of the fact that there is increased demand uh, for, for this kind of work. Um, and one would imagine that as part of that, then, then, then guidance is, 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 is clearly going to be a part of that. I think the only other point to make really is um, linkage. Uh, we we don't really offer a service where we do linkage for individual projects um, because I mean as as the questions kind of alluded to it's it's a it's a kind of a very specialist area it's it's kind of very resource you know in, in, intensive t takes a long time uh, the the model really under the ADI partnership is that where there is demand for two data sets to be linked for for sort of multiple research use, i.e. not just one project, but if you can demonstrate that, that this data set will, will be will be used over again, um, then then that that sort of you know feeds into the process and, and, and we'll we'll do an assessment and hopefully um, be able to 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 meet that demand. Um, and the only other thing I would say is there is an awful lot of demand uh, for linkage within ONS at the moment. Um, so I I hope that's answered the question. Okay, no. I think we've we've answered all the questions. So I will close for the afternoon then, but I would like to just say thank you very much to all of you who came along this afternoon. I hope you found that useful. Um, any comments after the event, then obviously please, please do um, drop us an email and we'll we'll try and help in any way we can. Um, so thank you to, to James for, for joining me. He's he's put his picture on, so I'm hoping he's still okay behind the picture. Um, I'm alive. I'm alive. Yeah, <laughs> Perfect. Um, and a big thank you to Nick O'Donnell and Bill South from the ONS for all your input this afternoon and for answering those, those questions. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm sure we will speak to some of you as you go through your, your research in the future.